Hi, I am Mrs. Sloan, and we are getting ready for AP Bio Unit 3. And we are following the directives of the College Board about what's in Unit 3. And I want to show you my Master HyperDoc so you can see the big picture of where Unit 3 is going. So let me make myself a little bit smaller. You can find any of these HyperDocs, which are in alignment with the, in alignment with the College Board, if you just Google me, Winnie Sloan Google Sites, and pick AP Bio in the tabs, and you will be here. So we are on cellular energetics. This is unit three. I just want you to see the big ticket items this is about. You can see 3.1 talks all about enzymes. Enzymes catalyze reactions. They make them happen, okay? Um, so we'll talk about the process of the way enzymes work and what can impact whether they work or not work, right? So we'll talk about their functionality. Now, right here is 3.4 cellular energy. Describe the role of energy in living organisms. That's actually where I will start the presentation today in chapter six, because that makes more sense to me to start there. And the first thing I want you to see right here is that all living, all living systems require the constant input of energy right here. Let me get a pointer so I can show you that. Oh, apparently I'm not gonna have a pointer. Okay, so all living systems require the constant input of energy. Remember, living things are organized, made of cells. We already learned this, right? They acquire materials and energy. So we need a constant input of energy. Why? So that they can what? Maintain homeostasis so that they can respond to stimuli and reproduce so that they can grow, so that they can develop, they can, a population can adapt, and then eventually it will die. But to get this thing going, we have to acquire materials and energy. So this process, we'll talk about how the reactions in our body are then facilitated by enzymes, okay? That's chapter six. Chapter seven for us in our book is then we're gonna focus on um, photosynthesis. It's here somewhere, I just went past it, so sorry. Um, so photosynthesis is 3.5. Now let's think about what that means, right? This is the ability of photoautotrophs to capture the sun's energy and transform that into sugars, into potential energy, okay? So they are able to fix CO2 into glucose. So when we acquire materials and energy, we're going to get that um, via plants or animals who have eaten the plants. Now, what we do with those sugars, once we have acquired them, that is chapter eight, and that is all about cellular respiration. So we will talk about both anaerobic and aerobic respiration, um, and in, in, and when we talk about how we oxidize glucose in order to generate ATP, you already know who the powerhouse of the cell is where that's gonna take place, that's gonna be in the mighty mitochondria, all right? So one thing I don't want you to get confused about is sometimes people accidentally say that plants do photosynthesis and animals do cellular respiration. Plants or autotrophs definitely do um, photosynthesis, but all cells do cellular respiration, all cells, because they are going to need to break down those sugars in order to generate ATP, the cheddar, the money of how cells function. All right, so we're gonna start right back here at cellular energy, and then we're gonna start talking about enzymes. So let me move over to today's presentation, chapter six, hopefully, oh good, I popped up right there, and let me put this in presentation mode, all right? So the first part's pretty easy, I think. Um, I know you know that energy is the capacity to do work, right? And so we can put that on our notes. By the way, if you're new to watching these videos, down in the descriptor of the video, you will find my group shared notes, column number one. There will be blanks in there that you will um, fill in using um, this video. And column two, I encourage you to put pictures and diagrams and things that will help you with the learning process in there. All right, so, and also you will have a link to this presentation that I'm giving right now. So energy is the ability to do work or to bring about change, the ability to do work or bring about change. Now, ultimately, all the energy we have is dependent on what? Hopefully you are telling me the sun, right? So the sun is breaking down, right? And as a process of its greater entropy, it's breaking down, becoming less organized, it's releasing heat energy towards us. 
So autotrophs capture that heat energy and use that to make a little bit of ATP um, and some reduced NADP in order to fix CO2 into glucose. Then we eat that glucose or animals who have eaten that glucose. But ultimately for us, all energy comes from the sun. So make sure you have that up there on your notes. Then just looking at the different types of energy, this is super cartoony, okay? But just look, you have potential energy, you have kinetic energy, like kinetic energy is like energy of motion. Potential energy, this little boy is holding up this ball that he could drop, but there's also potential energy in a sandwich too, right? Energy in those bonds. And there's thermal energy, um, heat from friction. Look what's going on right here. This energy, this light, right? Plants are capturing it in order to fix CO2 into glucose. So let's just level it up one more time, okay? And just look at some different examples here of how energy can change forms. So when we look here, we can see an automobile is burning, let's say, gas or maybe you have an electric car, right? In order to make your engine work or to make your wheels go around here, you can see thermonuclear reactions. You can see two forms here of electrical energy to power up and either create radiate energy or energy of motion, mechanical energy. Here's that photosynthesis again, here's force. So I just want us to keep in mind all the ideas of energy, all right? So on your notes, kinetic energy, let's, to make it simple, anything moving has it. Anything moving has it. Potential energy is stored energy. Potential energy is stored energy. And then chemical energy is just a form of potential energy. And that it's energy that is stored in molecules. Specifically, it's dependent upon those bonds in those molecules. All right? Good. We understand all different kinds of energy. So let's talk. We're going to talk about two laws of thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics says energy cannot be created or destroyed. It just is going to change forms, right? Because we, there's no more energy than what we've got here in our universe, right? And it's coming from the sun and we can have it change forms. Now, the second law is going to say that every time we change those forms, that you're gonna lose some of that useful energy. And generally it's lost as heat, okay? We're gonna lose some of that useful energy. As a result of us not maintaining all of that energy, because every time it changes forms, we lose a little bit, entropy, which is disorganization, increases. Okay, so put a pin in entropy because I'm going to come back to that. And let's just review these two laws just a little bit more. So on your notes, laws of thermodynamics, basics, the study of energy transformations that occur in matter. The first law, the first law is also known or also called the law of conservation of energy. The law, I'm so small, the law of conservation of energy. All right. And it states that energy cannot be created or destroyed, but it can be transferred and transformed. That means type that in your notes. It can be transferred or transformed, right? So this solar energy right here is getting converted to the potential energy of carbohydrates here in this chloroplast. All right. And then I gave you an example right below that. The second law of thermodynamics, okay, it states that every transfer, every transformation that takes place increases entropy or the amount of disorder slash randomness in the universe. The amount of disorder or randomness in the universe. So randomness and disorder is on the up. Okay, um, and then this is why you go to greater and greater disorder, right? So this is why you have to ac acquire materials and energy so you can fight the disorder, so you can maintain homeostasis because your body won't, will break apart unless you have that constant input of energy, all right? So example, you could be working out, not all of, if you're like lifting weights or whatever, not all the energy is gonna go into the force that's lifting those weights, you are going to create heat energy and that is not useful right it's just going to emanate out and be lost to the universe it is not destroyed it is just not useful energy it is increasing the entropy of the system and here's another little picture to show you that right so sun's energy going into the plant right going to this moose the moose moves mechanical energy but look right so energy is not created or destroyed but it can just be transferred or transformed. But every time, the second law says, every time it changes hands, you lose some as heat.
So on your summary, can't create energy, only convert. Can't create energy, you can only convert. Okay, at every conversion, some of the energy will dissipate as heat, will dissipate as heat and become less useful. All right, then let's just look at a little example of entropy. What do you think about this kitchen? Okay, this kitchen, okay, its entropy, its amount of disorganization is high, off, off the charts high, right? This kitchen is a mess. Now, I don't know what it's like in your house, but in my household, we go to bed and the kitchen is always clean because we like that, right? But in order to keep that kitchen clean, there is a constant input of energy to wipe down the counters or to wash the dishes, right? Um, to put away food. So we are constantly inputting that energy, right? In order to maintain homeostasis, right? We are always fighting entropy. Think about your bedroom right now on a scale of one to 10. 10 would be the highest level of entropy. There's no clothes in your drawers, they're all over the floor, your bathroom is a mess, right? That would be a 10, a very neat bedroom with your bed made and everything put away and your desk neat, that would be a one on the entropy scale. So entropy is disorder and we are always trying to fight that. So where this would be high entropy, this kitchen would be low entropy, but in order to keep it this way, we have to constantly um, put um, energy into the system. Now, I want to notice something about this, okay? A very organized system is actually less stable, right? Because everything tends to go to greater and greater disorder. This is less stable. So, for instance, you could run into this kitchen to get a snack and accidentally knock the bowl off or whatever and create disorder and then you would have to fix that, right? So this is actually less stable, okay? This is actually more stable because it can't get any worse than that. So which one can we do more work with though? Can we work in this kitchen very well? No, we cannot. So we need to have, if you wanna do work, low entropy, which is actually less stable system that we can then use that tendency for it to become less stable to help us do work. All right, so on our notes, it's defined um, entropy as the relative amount of disorganization. So entropy is the relative amount of disorganization. So let's look at some examples now in biology. Okay, oh, not yet. I have another diagram apparently for you. So this right here, right, is highly, highly organized. So imagine if you were stacking all of these up, it is actually though less stable, though it is very low entropy and highly organized, right? Because this will tend to fall apart, which will increase the entropy, but this becomes more stable. All right, take a look right here. Okay, and I'll show you a video in class that's pretty cool. It's, uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. So this is an ice cube, right? And this ice cube, if it's solid, is gonna tend to melt, okay? And increase the entropy and go to greater and greater disorder as a liquid. But in the universe, right, it's all equal, right? It's not like we're running out of that energy. We're just changing the amount of useful energy, right? And if you think about, if you had um, a cup of tea and you put an ice cube in that cup of tea, you could see how as that ice cube melts and that water, right, becomes more tempered, it's gonna cool off, but you would have to put work into it, like putting it in a freezer to get it back to freeze again, right? It's gonna just keep going to greater and greater disorder without the input of energy. Okay. So let's look at a couple of molecules here. Here is glucose. You've got a lot of potential energy in this bond. It is much more organized, okay? Now, as far as entropy goes, it is less stable, right? Which means it has less entropy, but it will go to a more stable form, higher form of energy as you go from glucose, right, down to carbon dioxide and water. And basically, that is cellular respiration. And when you break those bonds down, the energy that gets released, you capture a very small percentage of it actually, you capture a very small percentage of it and you convert that into ATP, a high energy compound that can be used by your body's cells, okay? So on your notes, you have examples, let's see. Um, 
Oh, yes, I do. I have examples. Glucose breaking down into carbon dioxide and water. Okay, so I just want you to know some of that energy is captured in the process to make ATP and some is just lost as heat. All right, and here is another example. And this is going to be key for our next two chapters on cellular respiration and photosynthesis. So I know you recognize this. This is a phospholipid bilayer, right? And running through the middle of this, this is a protein. Now what I want you to see is these hydrogen ions are concentrated on one side of the membrane, okay? So that is more organized because they're on one side. This has more potential energy because all these hydrogen ions are on one side. And they will want, remember we talked about diffusion, right, in chapter five, they will want to go to a, from a higher concentration to a lower concentration, right? And what we have set up right here is what you could consider a chemiosmotic gradient. There's a difference of three here. We have a difference in concentration. There are more hydrogen ions on this side of the membrane than that side of the membrane. There's another difference we have, and that's a difference in charge, right? There are more positive charges on this side of the membrane than that side of the membrane, okay? And the third one is pH. There is a pH. This is a lower pH on this side than the other side. So it's, it's a difference of three, and that is what you call a chemiosmotic gradient. It has a lot of potential to do work because there's a big motivating factor for these molecules to move from this side through the other side. Now, when this occurs, when hydrogen ions um, move, they can go through a channel that is enzymatic. Remember, we talked about the different functions of proteins, and one is enzymatic, and that is something called ATP synthase, ACE, ACE, ATP synthase complex, and you can harvest that energy in order to make ATP. It's kind of like if people wanted to go into Disneyland, right, and they're all waiting to go into Disneyland, you go through that turnstile, and they're all waiting for Disneyland to open, waiting, finally it opens, and people are rushing through the turnstile to go in. They're highly motivated. Every time that turnstile goes, you're generating an ATP molecule. So just imagine these are people wanting to get to the other side of that membrane to get into Disneyland. So when this moves from these hydrogens move from here to here, look, here's that energy, right? And we can capture some of that energy to make ATP. This side is less organized because it's even Steven on either side. It has less potential energy though it is more stable, okay? And we'll be talking more about that in the next two chapters as well. All right, so on your notes, on the summary, um, actually, I have another one for you. Let me give you here. We'll do this in class. Um, on our summary, I want us to put down that energy conversions result in heat, Therefore, the entropy of the universe is always increasing. Therefore, the entropy of the universe is always increasing. And we need an input of energy to fight entropy in our own bodies and in order to maintain homeostasis. So our universe going to greater and greater entropy. The sun's loss is our gain. All right. Now. That was 6.1, cells in the flow of energy. So now let's go to 6.2, metabolic reactions and energy transformations. All right, so metabolism is the sum total of all the chemical reactions that occur in your body. Some of those reactions are anabolic, meaning they build, okay, you synthesize things. Some of those reactions are catabolic, where it breaks down. So on your notes, pause if you need to and just put that in there, the sum of all the chemical reactions that occur in the cell. Anabolism or an anabolic pathway, you want to add in there, it consumes energy to build complicated molecules from simpler ones. To build complicated molecules from simpler ones, like building muscle in response to exercise. Catabolic reactions or catabolic pathways leads to the release of energy by the breakdown of complex molecules. Release of energy by the breakdown of complex molecules to simpler compounds. And a good example of that is cellular respiration. All right, so let's look here. Just a simple little diagram about metabolism, okay? So I want you to start up here at the top. Here's some large molecule. It's getting broken down into the smaller molecules. And when that breaks down, it releases the energy out of that bond. That energy is released and you can couple it with an anabolic reaction you've got going on here at the bottom. 
This reaction right here, you're taking smaller molecules and building a larger, more complex molecule. So as one, the top reaction releases energy, you can couple that with that bottom reaction that requires energy in order to build, and that would be a coupled reaction. So we'll, we'll get into coupled reactions in just a little bit, but I wanted to kind of introduce that to you a little bit first. All right, and next, I want to review, and hopefully this is a review, reactants versus products. So um, on your notes, reactants will participate, right? They're what you need to make something, and you can add that to your notes. For instance, the reactants of photosynthesis, you need sunlight, right? Energy from the sun, you need carbon dioxide, and you need a source of water if you're going to do non-cyclic photophosphorylation. The products are what you make at the end. So the products form as a result of the reaction, form as a result of the reaction. So the products of photosynthesis are glucose, sugar, and oxygen. Now, just so you think about this, right? The reactants of photosynthesis and the products of photosynthesis, right? You reverse that for cellular respiration, right? For cellular respiration, these are the reactants and these are the products, except we don't make sunlight. Obviously, we make ATP. So I just want to keep you thinking about how those two reactions are coupled together. All right, next, let's talk a little bit about free energy, delta G. And this is how much energy you have um, available to do work, all right? So to visualize that, let's think about a ball rolling downhill, okay? In an exergonic reaction, overall, you are releasing energy. You started up here with more energy, now you have less, okay? So if you follow this graph right here, this shows you how much energy was released by this system as a result of this reaction, okay? so. Um, this bottom reaction is endergonic. It has an overall net input of energy into this reaction, right? It, it, will, it will not be spontaneous if it's an endergonic reaction. You have to put energy into this system right here. And here you can see the amount of energy that was has changed between what would be the reactants and what would be the product. All right, now on your notes, you have free energy is the amount of energy left to do work after a chemical reaction has occurred, and it's also called delta G, um, and it's measured in kilojoules. All right, now let's compare on another chart, exergonic, that's easy for me to remember because exergonic like exit and endergonic like in, you're putting it in. Let's look at another chart right here, okay? so. On here, you look right here, your delta G, you're following the signs right here, is less than zero in an exergonic reaction. So look right here, This, these are your reactants and these are your products. Now, if you notice, you are going to have to input a little bit of energy into this system to even get this going, to overcome the inertia of that, right? If you think about like balls at the top of the hill, they're not gonna just spontaneously roll down. You would have to push them or move something so that they would then start rolling down that hill, right? This right here is the energy of activation. And this right here has become, become really important when we start talking about enzymes because they're gonna lower that hurdle, that energy of activation. But what you're measuring in this between the reactants and the product is just the change, the net change from where you started as a reactant to where your product is. And notice you have less energy, so your delta G is negative. So it's a loss or release of free energy, and the reactants had the most energy. Now, on the opposite here, on an intergonic reaction, notice your delta G, your overall change, is greater than zero. So here are your reactants, here are your products. You're going to have to put energy into the system in order for you to make that product. So on your notes, please, if you have a negative delta G, if you have lost free energy, we never lose energy, but we lose um, free energy, okay? The delta G negative is an exergonic reaction. You have a loss or release of usable energy, and the reactants have more energy. Over here, on the endergonic reaction, you have a positive delta G. It is an endergonic reaction. You have an input or gain of energy. Input or gain of energy is required. The products have more free energy. 
The products have more free energy. Okay, next, okay, when we talk about energy, of course, we're gonna talk about ATP. ATP is the energy currency of the cells. And so we need to look at that as an example of energy in bonds. And we've already introduced this in my class, right? When we talked about the four important organic molecules and ATP is an example of what? A nucleic acid along with DNA and RNA. And nucleic acids, as you know, are made out of nucleotides. So in this case, you can see here you have a sugar, ribose. Oh, sorry, here's your sugar, ribose. You have a base adenine. Together they are known as adenosine, okay? And then you have, um, and that would be like a nucleoside. Um, and then once you put in your phosphates, you have three phosphate molecules. With those high energy um, third phosphate especially, okay, when you break that off, and notice this right here, we're breaking off a phosphate group. What's happening here? We have an input of water. Do you remember what that was called? Hydrolysis, right? So you are inputting that water and and you are then breaking the bond between that third phosphate and when you do that you get about 7.3 kilocalories of energy released to do a reaction that requires atp in your body in that organism so on your notes basics atp is the energy currency of the cell you hydrolyze the bond connecting the third phosphate group and release 7.3 kilocalories of energy. The structure is adenosine, which is adenine plus ribose, plus three phosphate groups, plus three phosphate groups. Okay, now, remember when I talked to you earlier about a coupled reaction, how one reaction that um, re would release energy, you can use that for a second reaction that requires energy. So in coupled reactions like this, ATP hydrolysis, so when you hydrolyze this ATP, can be coupled with an endergonic reaction so that energy loss is minimized. So that energy loss is minimized. Okay? Now, I'll, there's a little more on those notes, but I want to show you this next picture. Okay, so this is showing you metabolism, right? All the enzyme-mediated reactions of our body. So if you look right here, okay, you have simple molecules like glucose and amino acids, etc., and you are um, you are breaking those molecules down. And in the process of breaking down those molecules, you can build ATP back. This is a coupled reaction, as we as we oxidize the glucose as we break it down we can transfer that energy right to some atp um, in order to build it um oh sorry right here sorry got distracted so here's our complex molecules here we are building our atp okay then when you want to let me put this over okay and then when you go keep, kind of keep going around this circle, if you have a simple glucose molecule and you want to build glycogen, if you have amino acids and you want to build a protein, glycerol and fatty acids, if you want to do an anabolic reaction, you're going to have to spin that ATP that you made. So you're coupling those reactions together. Notice second law of thermodynamics, every time it changes forms, you are losing some as heat. Okay, um, and I have another picture for you here. I like, yay, more and more pictures. So this is showing you that coupling. So here you're using that ATP, you're investing the energy in the ATP to take this C and D and you are converting it now to A and B. Now, which has more energy, C and D, or does A and B have more energy? Hopefully you are telling me A and B because A and B got the energy that was from the ATP. And now the ATP is spent, okay? It is spent and now it's just adenosine diphosphate and a um, phosphate group. All right, um, and let me show you another one. Okay, this is very similar to what I just showed you just, just a little bit ago, right? So when you do cellular respiration, when you do a catabolic reaction, like breaking down those sugars, right? You're releasing energy 
from those bonds in the sugars, and you're capturing that energy in a coupled reaction to take ADP and convert it to ATP. Here, now I can use that energy currency, the dollar bills in my cells, I can spin that ATP, I can spin that energy to do endergonic reactions, reactions that require the input of energy, like active transport and cell movement. Okay, so on your notes, on your coupled reactions, I think we already did A, so B, um, as glucose is hydrolyzed through cellular respiration, ATP can be synthesized, that's what we're seeing right here on the left-hand side, ATP can be synthesized from ADP and inorganic phosphate. However, remember how I told you we always lose some as, as um, heat, it is only 39% efficient. 61% is lost as heat, 61% is lost as heat. It's only 39% efficient, okay? That would be like if I said, hey, I've got this $100 bill and I need some change because I can't put it in this machine over here to get a soda, I need some change. Can you give me change? And you're like, sure, Miss Sloan, I can give you change, but I can only give you $39. I'm like, but I have a $100 bill. Glucose is like that $100 bill. But in the exchange process, in order for us to get our ATP, it's like we only get $39 in, in, um, in useful energy that we have transferred to the next molecule, all right? $61 is just lost, okay? And that contributes to entropy. So why would we want all of this ATP? Okay, let me get to this next one right here. Okay, oh, and here's that diagram where I just said, here's glucose, it's like a $100 bill, but we only harvest about 39% of its energy when we do cellular respiration. Hmm, I wish I would've put that one on there. Okay, so what do we need ATP for? We need ATP for chemical work, okay? Transport work and mechanical work. So chemical work um, is used to synthesize macromolecules, used to synthesize macromolecules. So that would be an anabolic reaction, right? That requires energy. Okay, and um, transport work used to pump substances across a membrane, transport work, and let me get, I have a picture for that. Okay, for transport work, and so here we've talked about this in chapter five, right? Look at this, this should be really a good review for you. So here you have oxygen diffusing from a higher concentration to a lower concentration, and it's small, it's not polar, it can move right through that phospholipid bilayer, right? Here we can see sodium because it's an ion. It's used, it's called facilitated diffusion, right? For it to move across. Here's glucose. Look at this. Remember the sodium potassium pump, right? That requires um, the use of energy to pump three sodiums out for every two potassiums in. So that would be your example of transport work used to pump substances, substances across a membrane. And then the last one, would be mechanical work. Boy, is she working out hard. That's some big weight. Okay, so mechanical work is used to permit movement, like flagella, we learned about flagella, chromosomes to move, or your cytoskeleton when you're doing like endo and exocytosis. All right, and that then brings us, we're gonna start talking about, in, in our video two, we will start talking about metabolic pathways, metabolic pathways. Okay.